Oh, I can't even think straight right now. Wasn't the kids cool? Oh, my goodness. I, have, I mean, I'm like, well, I was standing back. I started doing the hand motions, and then I started getting, like, self-conscious. And it's like, why? You know, like, I'm in the back. There ain't no one behind me. You know, I'm looking at all of you all doing hand motions. And I'm like, I'm getting self-conscious. But, I mean, that's what our pride does so often, right? It makes us think about us. And it crushes the movement of the spirit that he wants to do because we're so busy thinking about us. And, uh, man, just that childlike faith, these little kids coming up here and just singing their hearts out to God and doing the motions and just joyfully encouraged and yet convicted at the same time of just it. Why do we make it so hard, you know? Why do we make this thing, this, this walking out this relationship so hard on ourselves? And, and the truth is, is that I, if you're like me, it's because you think about yourself so much, right? I talked about it last week. I wake up thinking about me, you know, the selfishness of the nature that we have. And I just, something happened last week. If you were here last week, you got to witness the move of God. We had three people step out in faith and get physically healed right in front of all of us. And then Dana was sharing with us tonight before service that she didn't get up, but she received healing just by agreeing with the healing that was going on in front from her seat in the back row and that she got healed. He's like, God, give God some glory. Come on. Lift up his name. God is good. And yet so quickly this week, the kids are up here singing and I've been, pontificating and thinking about, God, what happened? God, you know, you try to figure God out and like, God, why did you, why were you so good? Like, like it's some sort of mystery. Like it should be a surprise that God's that good. And, and I'm back there and I'm worried about if maybe someone would look back and see Pastor Caleb up there doing hand motions two seconds behind the beat because he's really white and he doesn't know what he's doing, you know? And it's like, and and it's like how quickly I can turn from God doing something miraculous the week before to worrying about how I look amongst my own family. I don't want to see a move of God happen to where it just happens and then we forget about it. It's that thing. John, you, you gave a powerful sermon months back about resting on a move of God back, was it 2008? And, 2008 and not wanting to rest in something God did before. And going, man, God was good because he did something way back then. We don't want to forget those things, but they should not be just a moment that we look back on. God was good once. I was studying this whole idea of this healing. And as we get into testimonies tonight, I just want to encourage you guys for the boldness of your faith to come and share what God is doing in your life. If God has spoken through his word, if he's used you, if he's done something miraculous in your life, to share it. Because, get this, get this. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelations 19. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Paul says, I eagerly desire that you would, I, I desire that you would all eagerly pursue the gifts, especially the prophetic, because it encourages and builds up the body of Christ. When you share the testimony of Jesus, you release the prophetic spirit of God on his people. And what that means is that God is either going to show you things he has for you in his future, or he's going to show the goodness that he has already given you an inheritance and deposit it right into you. He's going to speak life into you through his spirit of prophecy when we testify to the goodness of God in our life to one another. And we're going to get into testimony. This testimony thing is we're wrapping up 1 John. we got 2nd and 3rd John coming up to get through 1, 2, 3 John. As we wrap up 1 John, we're going to talk about this victory through the testimony of Jesus Christ. And what happened last Sunday radically changed the way I read chapter 5 of John, which we're going to go through tonight. But it's so easy we can get caught thinking about ourselves like it did back there, and we can go, man, no one wants to hear what God's doing in my life. I don't have anything to share and all we're doing is we're quenching the Spirit by holding back. Romans 10, 17 says that we grow by faith by hearing the words of Jesus Christ. Not just reading your Bible, but by hearing the words of the Lord. And so when we share the works and the Word of God in our life with others, we release faith upon one another. And so who would like to start tonight by igniting the spirit of the prophetic and releasing faith on their brothers and sisters by sharing the goodness of God. Come on up, sister. Amen. Amen. 
puts me in a predicament. You guys sharing all this good stuff God's doing leaves me no time to talk. Amen. Hey, yeah, thank you. There we go. Get that preacher off that stage. All right. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. Jesus. Jesus, we give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to give us courage. Let these words resonate in our heart. Increase our faith, Lord. We believe, Lord, but help us in our unbelief to step out in faith. The things we desire in your word, the things that we, we want to see come true, that your word says can happen as we wrestle and, and pursue these things privately, Lord. Give us a courage and, and, and a faithfulness to be able to take risks publicly so that we can see the goodness of your word come to life in the life of others in our life. Jesus, we want to be moved. Holy Spirit, come right now. Holy Spirit, come. Make your word come alive. Make the word come alive and move us. Move us to love God and to love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I was joking with people last week. I was on like hyper mode because, again, like <laughs> we're an hour into this thing already. Uh, so... It, everything got changed for me because of what we're looking, what we, we talked about last week and what God did last week, like I shared. And so if, if you're with us, open your Bible to 1 John uh, chapter 5. It's towards the end of your Bible. Um, and uh, it's before Revelation and Jude and, and 2nd and 3rd John. And it's after Hebrews and James and 1st and 2nd Peter. Uh, so go ahead and open to 1st John chapter 5. And we're going to try to move through this as quickly as possible. But there's some truth in here that I think to bring victory. The whole idea of tonight and wrapping up this entire chapter in one time, I just want us to think about victory through the testimony. Our victory in life through the testimony. John recaps at the end of his letter everything he's talked about. And so we start in verse 1, and it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. He, he basically recaps the entire letter. He says, look, our, our entire lives come down to this, this truth. We know who Jesus is, and because we know who Jesus is, and the love that He's poured out on us, we in turn love God, and we love one another. And this is isn't tough. <clears throat> it's not burdensome. It's not hard. This should be this should be natural. I mean, but I like we talked about last week, I've already mentioned tonight, I wake up selfish. Loving y'all, loving loving my wife, loving anybody that's not me can be tough. Right? Choosing their best in God for them at my own expense, at my sacrifice, isn't easy. It's not natural. And so John says, this isn't burdensome, you know? My yoke is easy, my burden is light, follow me. It's, it seems almost contradictory, but then John, it's, it's like he knows that even hearing that, like, gosh, following Jesus, I mean, people, people are getting killed in this time, right? People are getting killed, they're getting persecuted, and he's going, man, doing this is anything but easy, John. Like, you don't understand what we go through. It's like, our, have you... Have you gotten so old and senile that you forgot how hard it is to follow Jesus? But John's not talking about the outward pressure of life. He's talking about the inward life of Jesus, that when we have a proper understanding of who God is and who we are in Him, that all of a sudden, loving God, taking the love of God and returning it to Him, it becomes easy. And loving others becomes immensely easy when we see God for who He is. And then He gives us, I believe He gives us the keys to what it means and what it looks like to walk victoriously. In verse 4, it says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That word overcome is the same word used to, for victory coming up in a moment. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory, same word in the Greek, that has overcome, victory again, the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's a rhetorical question at the end, saying, of course, the people who are victorious, this word in the Greek is nikeo. It means to, to carry off in victory, to, to, to speak, pierce with defeat your opponent is to be completely victorious completely victorious like who is victorious well of course those who put their faith their faith in Jesus Christ he says it four times this is an interesting thing speaking to Greek people Nikeo 
They made a god over this concept. You have to understand the Greeks were so about war and victory and being victorious, the god Nike, just do it. <laughs> the god Nike was responsible for the victory in Olympus with Zeus. They had an entire god. She was responsible for all victory in battle. And so this word Nike, which one of our top sporting brands, Boast, just do it. This little swoosh symbol, Nike, just be victorious. Go win. Go do it. Could it be possibly that a secular sporting brand knows more about the point of our faith and how we should operate than even we do? Just do it, right? John's like, look, victory, four times. Victory, victory, victory. And the context is he says it. It says, you will be victorious. He has made victory possible, and you are victorious now. You will be, he is, and you are victorious in Christ. That's what John's saying right here. He's like, this is a mindset. He's not talking about the practicalities yet. He's going to get there. But right now, he's just setting the mindset. He's like, look, take courage. This love thing is easy. Why? Because Jesus has already done it. You are victorious. You will be victorious because Jesus already was victorious and is victorious. He's completely over and over again in just two verses laying this foundation of understanding that, look, our perspective, the way we approach God, the way we approach our struggles, we talk about sin, our selfishness, all these things, is to approach it not from a place of looking at the problem and trying to fix the problem, but from a stance of victory of who we are in Christ and what Christ has already done. That when we have a perspective from that angle, when we understand who Jesus is and who he's called us to be and what he's already done in our life, sin all of a sudden has no power over us anymore. But when we look at the sin, when we start to look at our problems, when we look at the lack of provision we feel like God's given us, when we look at these different things from the perspective of the problem, victory is hard to find. He says, you are victorious three times. And what is victorious? And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith. You see, but faith is not a believing in the mind. It's not an understanding that we have, but rather it's a trusting our soul. It's a conviction from our heart that gives it life for its object of faith. And our object of faith is Jesus Christ, period. Like Priscilla just said, the only way. Our faith is in Jesus in his finished work. Our faith our faith. And what is it? It's faith and a testimony. So he says our victory is in God. It's in our faith in Jesus Christ. That's where we claim victory from. It's not in our circumstance. It's not how we think we can get out of it. It's not how we've failed in the past or succeeded in the past. Our victory is in our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. And then he goes to give testimony. And this is this is huge. In verse 6 through 11 of 1 John, he uses the word testimony nine times. It's translated different in the context as, as it gets translated in English, but the same Greek word is used nine times to talk about the testimony, the power of the testimony. Testimony in the Hebrew, they understood it differently. We understand it now. I, I was completely, my mind was open up to the power of testimony. We've been doing testimony since January here, but I really didn't understand. All I just knew is I'd heard men wiser than me with ministries that they always talk about, man, the testimony of Jesus, you know, just sharing what Jesus has done and how powerful that is. And I had seen it, but I really didn't, I didn't like, it wasn't a conviction. It was like, you know what, we need to be doing this. I believe this is true. The word of God says it's how we're supposed to operate. I don't know why, but it is. But the testimony, the, the Hebrew word for testimony, when you look at it and you break it down, it's two words. And one is to share and bear witness to, and the other one, get this, repeat, do it again, to do it again. You see, testimony is to share and bear witness to something that's happened, but it's also so that you can do it again, do it again. So we share our testimony. The reason why things started to happen, the reason why I believe healing broke out last week here and healing will continue to break out is because as we continue to share the testimony of what Jesus is doing, it builds faith and remembrance of the goodness and honor and glory to God of what he has already done and who he is in his character. And it will bring faith alive in each one of us so that we can do it again. So we can do it again. You see, testimony isn't just about sharing something that happened yesterday. Testimony is about sharing something that happened yesterday so it can prophetically, testimony is the spirit of prophecy, so it can prophetically push someone into their destiny tomorrow. Your testimony works as prophecy for someone's destiny. 
We have to understand this, that when we share the goodness of God, the power we hold, the power we release when we share the good things that God has done in our life and the good things that God is doing around us. And so John lays out what is the testimony that we hold on to. And so starting in verse 6, he says this, concerning Jesus. Hold on, I'm going to take some water. This is a long. This is he, Jesus. This is he who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony within himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne or manifested, made known, brought about concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave of us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the water, the blood, and the Spirit, I mean, that starts to get a little out there. Like, I, I started looking at this, and I was like, Lord, how am I going to preach on the testimony of the water, the blood, and the Spirit? What are you talking about in your scripture about water, blood, and Spirit? And so I started looking back and probably Leviticus 8 was one of the most astounding things, and the Spirit started to reveal things in Christ that re- reflect in Leviticus 8. And I don't want you to go there. There's a, lot, there's a lot of ritual stuff in Leviticus 8. But three things that happened. First, Moses, the first great prophet. We had the patriarchs who received the promise of God, but the first truly great prophet who, who, who gave us the law of God was Moses. It says that Moses washed Aaron, the high priest. Moses would wash Aaron with water. He would make him clean. And this was all in preparation so that Aaron could then sacrifice the bull that was necessary for the sins of the people and the two goats, and that he would go in and he would take blood and he would sprinkle it on himself and all over the altar so that he could go into the presence of God. And then when he was in there, what would happen is if he went in holy, honest before God, his sins forgiven, and and went in under the right circumstances in righteousness of his works and understanding, God would send fire to consume the sacrifice from heaven. In the presence of God was the very light within the tabernacle. And so you see the water, the washing of a man, the blood, the anointing for him to do the, the payment so that he could step into the presence of God in the spirit of God confirming the work by consuming the sacrifice. Yay, that means nothing, right? Now, it's, it's fascinating to me. But then I started thinking about Jesus. So you had the first great prophet in Moses, washed Aaron, the first priest. The greatest man among women, the prophet John the Baptist, baptizes Jesus to start his ministry. Now, there's something interesting to understand about this baptism. Jesus was perfect. John was doing a baptism of repentance, which means it was for people who had sinned, which is all of us, would come to John, and they would go, I have sinned, I need to get right with God, give me this baptism of repentance, and he would baptize. And John said, it's not right for me to baptize you. I, you know, I'm not even worthy to unstrap your sandals, let alone baptize you. And Jesus goes, it must be to complete the will. It must happen this way, John. You don't understand it, but it has to happen this way. You see, what Jesus was doing at the age of 30 was completing the work of the Father as far as righteousness, all the temptation, everything he had had that he needed to do to be a righteous son. In Jewish customs, your birthright, which was the authority to run your parents' business and receive the inheritance, was often given to the the oldest male at the age of 30 because it was understood that the age of 30 by the Hebrew people, and still to this day, that that was the age of strengthening where the fullness of maturity of a man was reached and wisdom was now had. Jesus, at the age of 30, had completed everything he needed to do in obedience to his father up to that point to step into the authority of the inheritance as the son of God and start his earthly ministry. We wonder why we don't hear about Jesus and miracles beforehand because he was following following every dot, every iota, every mark in the Torah, in the word of God, and completing it fully in his life so that at the age of 30, God, according to the customs of men, talk about grace, released his authority and his Holy Spirit on Jesus. The water, the testimony of the water, that the dove of the Holy Spirit came and rested. And it says in Mark that when the dove came, it actually ripped the heavens. This is a violent act. You see that the first man, the perfect man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, actually created an access point for the first time for the Holy Spirit to come on earth, not just to anoint, but to rest. 
He ripped open the heavens by his obedience to the very law. It's interesting that Joseph in Genesis was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, that saved all of Israel. And David finally assumed the throne of all of Israel at the age of 30. Jesus assumed the ministry of reconciliation at the age of 30. The priesthood, you could not be a priest in Israel to this day until you're 30 and you have a 20-year service from 30 to 50 years old. God was working something that his people would understand is that my son has completed everything I've asked him to, and therefore I'm releasing all authority and power, the entire, his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, here's the keys. Go for it. At the baptism, it's the water that testifies, the blood. We all talk about the blood a lot, the crucifixion. Jesus, in the next three to three and a half years, lived his life fulfilling everything his father told him to do. Everything he saw his father do in heaven, he repeated on earth. All the healings, all the prophetic words, all the, the ministering, all the preaching, everything he did. And then he hung on a cross, guiltless, dying. The blood was shed. He was a sacrificial lamb, the purest form the purest animal that could be brought forth to, to cleanse the sins. But instead of one man, Aaron, going in every year, one man, Jesus, tore the veil in the temple so that everyone could have access by the blood of the Lamb. You see what God is doing here, the testimony of the water at the baptism, the, the authority, the actual inheritance of God to His Son given through the depositing of the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus fulfilling the, the, the duty, fulfilling the, the family practice, the family calling by completely taking it all the way to the cross, offering His life on that cross so that the Holy Spirit wasn't just opened up so that God could come to earth, but now tearing the actual veil that kept men from the presence of God. So now the tearing has gone two ways, first from heaven to earth and now from earth to heaven, so that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, man can actually come into the presence of God without having to be a holy man, not once a year, not after a bunch of ritual, but just become as he was. And then the Spirit, the Spirit was there the whole time, descended on Christ like a dove at baptism, was with him everywhere he went, and he released it, breathing on people, received the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit was there. And when Jesus died, it says rocks split. The, the clouds were torn apart, and it thundered, and that the temple and the curtain, the curtain in the temple was ripped apart. The Holy Spirit was there. And then who rolled the stone away? The Spirit was there to testify to the life. Of God. The Spirit went in, in Moses' time would consume and receive and make acceptable the sacrifice on the altar. The Spirit is always there. This testimony, Jesus, his washing of the water, his obedience, his payment, his propitiation that he took all our sins and bore it on a cross. And the Holy Spirit now has a complete access because Jesus, in his obedience, opened heaven to earth and in his sacrifice opened earth back up to heaven so that we could have complete communication with God. Prophesied over Jacob at Bethel when he saw a ladder and angels descending and ascending and he called it the house of God because God just moves up and down at this place. Did you, our testimony is supernatural. I mean, this is crazy stuff, right? Jesus fulfilled the law and he released grace and mercy from the Father at his crucifixion. And then he gave us the spirit, the spirit that gave him life. Romans 8, 9 through 11. You, however, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The third part of the testimony is the spirit who gives life. Everything Jesus did to get to this one point for us so that we could have the spirit that brings life. Life. Life to your marriage. Life to your body. Life to your emotions. Life to your mind to bring life to you. And the more we testify to the times where God does this, we, we understand that it's, it's to bring to remembrance the things that God has done, not just to talk about it like it was this great thing and I'm settling it, but to bring remembrance to the things God has done so that we can anticipate and expect more, to expect more than just what we've already received and experienced in God. Jesus said in John 14, 
verse 11 through 14, speaking to his disciples, he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus is giving credit to that. Hey, look, I'm showing you. I'm showing you the heart of God by all the healing I'm doing. I'm showing you everything that God wants to do. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works I do. This isn't a may or might or sometimes. You will do the works I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I'm going to do it. And we've talked about this. And when we align up with, with the heart of God, when we understand the character of God, and we start praying for the things that God has already spoken to us through his word and has confirmed that it's part of his will, we can have a guarantee that God is going to move in that regard. A guarantee. The testimony. The testimony of what Jesus has already done, the testimony of when you've seen your will line up with God and God has done something, where you've seen the grace of God in your life and you start to share it, it releases more power. You'll do greater things than these. That's why I stand up before you confidently saying, the four people we saw healed last week, this is just a start. Amen. This is just a start. We're not here to play church, sing songs, shake each other's hands, say, nice, cute baby. <laughs> See you next Sunday. Greater things than these. The world needs a revival. The world needs people who are on fire for Jesus, who understand what God has done in them and what he says about them, and then boldly walk out with faith the very things God has done and says, but no, God, you said more, greater. I'm moving. I'm risking. And I'm going to share your testimony because I believe when I share your testimony of what you've already done, I can expect greater things than these. We will see the heavens open up and see the Spirit of God descend on people in mass. I'm not okay with just people growing bones in their hips. I want to see people raised from the dead. The testimony. Got to hold on to it. We got to hold on to what God has already done. Fight for it. This is the victorious life. Whenever you're struggling with sin, it's not to look at the sin. It's to look at Jesus. It's to remember what Jesus has done, what Jesus has said, and what Jesus says he's going to do. When you're struggling with sin, it's not to think about the sin. It's not to think about how you can control it or avoid it. It's to look at Jesus, what Jesus has done, what Jesus has said, about you and about he, himself. The victorious life is always looking at Christ. Anytime we start to look at our sin or our struggles, we're looking at us. And God has no room for a proud heart. I've shared the, the biggest relief I've ever had in my life of when I was struggling with sin is I came to this place where I realized that I can't do it anymore. I cannot cause my sexual deviancy to stop on my own willpower or with 12-step groups or accountability or any of those things. And I'm not coming down those. We need accountability. We need the body of Christ. We need things. But none of that was going to heal me. Pastor Mike has a great saying that locks only keep honest people out. If someone wants to break in, they're going to find a way. If I want to go screw off sexually or go get hammered or go do anything, I can have all the boundaries and accountability and software on my phone I want. I'm going to go do what I want to do. We put faith in so many processes and programs, we tell God to take a hike. How hungry are you for your sanctification? How hungry am I to be holy before God? How hungry am I to stand before God and say, I want to see the miraculous, and so I'm going to fight in private for your authority in my life so that I can risk in public to see your authority released. Deuteronomy talks about keeping the word of God in front of you, that it would be like a front lid on your eyes. Sorry, Don, not this one. My, I apologize. I'm just a front lid on your eyes. It would be on your doorpost. It would be on your sign. It would be above your, your bed. It would, you, you talk when you're lying down, when you're walking, when you're sitting up. It doesn't matter when you're sitting. Wherever you are, you would teach diligently the word of God. You would remember the word of God. And then after this part of the, there comes this great promise of all the blessings and benefit when we keep God at the forefront of our lives, of our minds, of our hearts, and we're always pursuing God with hunger, the promises, the blessings of benefit, because not just because God loves us, but because that's how he's ordained this world to work. 
but we compromise. I compromise. Verse 13 of 1 John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of the God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. I just touched on this, is when we are praying the things of God's heart and God's desire, we know we have what we pray for. There's a confidence in that. That when your heart is lined up with God, your hunger for God has changed the way you think. It's changed your desires, your time in the Word of God. You've fought for the Word of God. You've kept it in front of you. Your prayer life is strong because you don't do anything without asking your Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, to come into and speak directly to you. When we start to actually put these things into practice in faith, remember? It's not just, it's not a gimmick to get God to do what you want. In faith, God starts to change your heart for what you want. He starts to change your mind, renewing your mind for what is right in His eyes. And when you start aligning yourself with God, when we, st- we have confidence before Him. And whatever we ask, we know we'll receive it. People jumped up last week in confidence of what God wanted to do, and they received healing. God was glorified, and we share that, and we keep sharing that, and more and more will continue to happen. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. This is kind of an obscure verse, and because of where we're going tonight in short time, I'm not going to spend any time here. That The idea is that, look, there's things people have gone so far beyond. They've gone so far. They've rebelled against God. They've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, which is another one of those verses that many people debate on what that actually means. That, that it's almost like you're wasting time. They've shut God out completely. I don't know what that looks like, but we're taught to have a fear of the Lord because He is the one. He's an all-consuming fire, and it is a terrible, dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But at the same time, because of who we are and what we know, we can confidently come before Him because He's our Papa, because He loves us. Verse 18, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. The evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. You see, there's this idea of, of guarding that God protects. And the King James, the way the verbiage is, it can also be translated, if you guard the word of God, the devil will flee from you. It gives the guarding responsibility, the keeping the word of God onus on the person. That you would diligently keep the word of God before you. The testimonies of God. Deuteronomy 6, 17 through 19. Don, go ahead and flash it up. Thank you. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord that it may go well with you and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by trusting, by thrusting out all of your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. You hold on to the testimonies. You hold on to the statutes. Statutes is like thinking the way God thinks. The commandments is living the way God wants you to live. And the testimonies, the testimonies we've already talked about, is remembering and expecting. It's an expectation for God to do again the things he's already done. When we hold on to what God has already done and expect him to do it again, we hold on to the word of God and we live according to the word of God and we let our minds be transformed and renewed by the word of God and the Holy Spirit through prayer just so that we think the way God thinks all our enemies thrust from before us as he has promised. Sometimes we wonder, why is the enemy attacking me? Why am I having such a hard time with this? And we haven't aligned ourselves properly with the Holy One. We become isolated. I know when I'm frustrated with, with attack or I'm, I'm worn down and, and, and under attack, you tend to isolate. When you isolate, then you tend to insulate and you start to think about yourself and woe is me and all this stuff and, and you get bitter towards others and eventually you just get eradicated. The Bible says... The devil is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Lions like picking things out of the pack. Cut through the pack, cut through the pack, and they get the weak, the young, or the old, and they get them alone, and then they attack most effectively. Wolves do the same thing. 
Our strength is when we stay in the body of Christ, when we stay in the mind of Christ personally, but also publicly, corporately as a family. We stay together, encouraging one another, praying for one another, sharing the testimonies of God. The testimonies. The ark was called the ark of the testimony, as well as the ark of the covenant. And inside the ark was the stick that blossomed, according to the the spirit of God, Aaron's staff, a jar of manna, and then the the tablets of stone that gave the commandments of the Lord. It's interesting that you have two items that are about the testimonies, about the power of the miraculous God, and only one item that speaks to the law of God. And yet we so often get caught up on the law of God and don't give any credit to the power of the Holy Spirit doing the miraculous. The statutes, the testimonies, and the commandments, all three agree. The water, the blood, and the spirit, all three agree. He is so faithful, family. But we have to expect God to do big things. We've talked about all this love receiving the love of the Father and then giving the love to, to those around us and, and needing humility and all these things. But, but at the end of the day, it really isn't about us and what we do. We have to expect God to do big things. Like Grant said, just by a simple act of obedience to expectation that God will do something with what Grant did in obedience. Our expectation is not in our work, but it's in the work of the Holy Spirit. Our faith is grown. The prophetic released when we share the testimonies of what God has done. I'm going to close with this, this story of what happened to me this week since our healing. So last Friday before last Sunday, I took one of my best friends. For, he had surgery. He had surgery back-to-back Fridays on both his feet, one foot one week, and then this Friday another foot. And him and I talk about faith once in a while. He really doesn't like to. He's kind of non-confrontational, um, doesn't want to talk. He, he has hurts from the church when he was in youth and really doesn't believe in the New Testament, just thinks, you know, well, Jesus is good and all that, but you can get to God any different ways as long as you're a good person. Just that's kind of where he's landed because of his pain from his past. And so I'm driving him. I'm driving him last Friday. I'm driving him to uh, his surgery appointment. I just feel like the Holy Spirit's like, you offer to pray for your friend. You say you love your friend. Pray for your friend. And so I pray for him, and the surgery goes awful. They couldn't even do what they set out to do. They had to do something else, caused him more pain, less productivity in what they wanted. I'm just like, God, why? And we get here on Sunday, and I'm pacing back and forth. I'm starting to cry because I feel like the Holy Spirit is, I want to release healing. You guys have to understand what I'm already wrestling with from Friday afternoon. Man, the last time I prayed for someone, it went horribly, Right? I get up here and three people get healed. Four people with Dana get healed because of the spirit of God. It had nothing to do with me. I I was in fear and trembling up here, praying that God would do something. That night, my wife wasn't feeling so good. And she was actually at their house hanging out with my buddy's wife. And so I went over at that night, last Sunday, after all the healings and everything, I went over to their house to hang out. And and my buddy, you know, asked how church was. And I was just like, three people got healed tonight. It was awesome. Jesus like just showed up and two shoulders and a hip. Lady was stumbling up to the thing and then all of a sudden she was bending over, jumping up and down and two, two of her friends got their shoulders healed and he kind of looks at me and he goes, cool, that's, that's great, you know? Like, and like, you know, you can tell that look of doubt in someone's eyes, like, but he knows me. We've been friends for seven years. He knows I'm not a liar. He knows I don't fabricate things. I don't try to blow things out of proportion and I'm genuinely excited and I can see he's just like the wheels are turning. They're, they're just turning in his mind. He's like, Okay, cool. Yeah, okay, awesome. Hey, have you seen that trailer for the new Star Trek? You know, and I was like, okay. Have you seen that, that 60 Minutes episode of Beast Mode getting interviewed finally? You know, and like, so we watch some things and talk, and the girls are talking, and that was it. I drive him this Friday, and I'm 15 minutes late, because that's how I roll, and it's awful. I'm 15 minutes late. The truth is, I straight up forgot I was taking him to the hospital again. I'm, I'm, in, an, I'm in breakfast at Frankie Doodles downtown, and all of a sudden, I look at my, my phone, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I was supposed to be picking up my buddy two minutes ago. It's, it's 1217. At 1215, I was supposed to pick him up. I have to drive all the way to the top of the South Hill to get him. End up dropping this dude off in the rain out on the street saying, I'm so sorry. And he laughs at me. He goes, look, I'm going to tell my friends a pastor dropped me off in the rain. Wouldn't even take me to the bus station. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I got to get to my buddy. And so, like, I'm running late. I'm flying. And, of course, you hit every person that just wants to dilly-dally when you're in a hurry. So I get up there, and he's like, hey, man, don't worry about it. It's fine. We get in the 
car and we're driving. He's like, don't, you don't have to speed. It's fine. We'll, we'll get, we'll get there. It is what it is. And so we're talking, we're talking football. We talk a lot of football. That's kind of our, our big thing we talk about. And we get to the, the hospital. I pull up and I was like, dude, again, Dan, I'm so sorry. He's like 18 minutes late now for his uh, surgery, you know? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. And he stops. He goes, don't worry about it, brother. He's like, and he goes, he opens the door and he stops. He goes, Hey, would you pray for me again? <laughs> yeah. And so I prayed for him. I haven't talked to him. I don't know how the surgery went. I don't know what's going on. But the point is, is kind of like what Priscilla shares. When we step out and share the testimony of God, sometimes it might not happen the way we want it to happen. It might not happen right now. But God is doing something. And we got to trust the word of God in our life from the very beginning to the very end of it. That when we share the testimony of God, the prophetic word that I've been praying for my brother, my friend, is that he would be my brother that this man and his wife would come to know the saving love of Jesus Christ and find salvation in Christ and Christ alone, and their lives would be radically changed. But i got to share testimony. I don't have to go in there and preach at them all the time. Love on them. Share the testimony what God's doing. Stir the curiosity. Give an open invitation for his heart to ponder, is God real? Could God do that for me? If Caleb says it happened, if my friend says it happened, if you say it happens to your friends, could they sit there and go, man, so that happened, could he do it again? We got to be a people that is about doing it again and again and again and again until every wall crumbles and the people around us in their lives to where they see nothing but the love of Jesus for them because we have shared the love of Jesus in our life unashamed and we share it again and again and we release the prophetic word over their life, the word that brings hope. Revelations 12, 11. We're going to pray. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb, the finished work of Jesus, the payment that Jesus made that none of us could and never can pay off. And by the word of their testimony, for they not, they love not their lives unto death. The word of your testimony. We are victorious. Any sin you're struggling with, anything that you are having a hard time with, the word of testimony, the, the focusing your, your heart, your mind, and your life on Jesus will start to release the healing of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm not promising you instantaneously. I'm not, I'm not telling you how it's going to play out. God does unique things in all of us, but I guarantee you that the word of God is true. And if he says he will release healing, he will release his prophetic spirit into your life when you start to give yourself over to God completely, not even to the fear of death, just completely give him over, he will start to radically change. Share your testimony. Sometimes the best person that needs to hear your testimony is you when the devil's got your ear. You need your testimony every day. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you again. I just, I can't stop giving you praise for what you've done, Lord. I'm going to give you praise in advance for the more and the greater that you're going to do, that as we share what you have already done here, that it isn't just a repeating of words and sharing uh, our witness of what we saw and experienced, but it is the do it again part of your promise and a testimony. That you will release your prophetic spirit to bring life, the resurrection life of Christ on each and every one of us and an insight into your heart for others as we share our testimony with our friends and family, our co-workers, and even our enemies, that your testimony and your blood, the finished payment, the reason why we now are the temple of God is why you can dwell in us. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all honor and praise. Amen. All right, you guys, if you need prayer, I'll be over here. And who? And the shepherds. Yeah, John and Karen, if you need prayer, hey, if you want prayer for healing, Come get it.